Did you bring your Bibles this morning? Yeah. All right. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to get there, but I'm going to share, start a series today called Real Church. Real Church. Now, it's called Real Church. I believe that these messages, especially today, um, something about coming out of worship and even offering time and stuff, I'm being, I'm being ultra real today. I, there's just a realness here. Um, this is just church family, right? This is um, a pastor, hopefully iron sharpening iron here. But fair warning, this is going to be one of the most real messages you've ever heard. Because we're living in a time where a lot of people are playing church. So I've titled this Real Church because there's a lot of play church out there. And, um, and so as we go through this, there are going to be some things that might hit close to home. There might be some things that, uh, that you've thought about you know, in, in churches throughout your lifetime. I mean, if you've been in church any more than five, six, seven, eight, 10, 15 years, you know, if you, a lot of people have been in church, how many of you have been in church longer than 10 years in your life? How about longer than 15? How about longer than 20? 25? 30? 35? 40? This next one, I got to put my hand down. 45? 50? Oh, this is fun now. 55? 60? 65? 70? This is where you put your hand down. 75? 80? Sam Fish. 80 years old, been in church. We got a, uh, a gentleman and his wife, dear, dear partners of this church, Mr. Truman and Miss Louise, watching from home. Uh, and you could have kept yours up till, I think, Miss Louise to 85 and Mr. Truman over 90. So I believe he's 92 if, if my math is right. So anyway, uh, just awesome people. So we've got a great heritage. Yes. My goodness. I thought maybe 15, 20 years would be a long time for some people to be in church, but getting 60, 70 years, wow. So those of you that had your hand up for much of that exercise, has seen a lot of play church. Oh, yes. 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 Seen a lot of play church. And so I want to define today what church is. Uh, a lot of you know what church is. Uh, I've taught along some of these lines before, somewhat. Uh, so some of you guys are going to know, some of this might sound familiar, some of you guys may not know what church is. There are people in this room I guarantee that don't know what church is. If I had to ask them to come up here, they would not give the Bible de definition of what church is. And so we're going to start from the very beginning. We're going to talk about what it is. We're going to talk about what it meant to Jesus. And over the next, I would say it's going to be three or four weeks total, um, we're going to talk about a lot of aspects of church, how we can really impact a world. How many of you know that there's a world that is in desperate need of being touched and impacted with kingdom principles? Yeah. Amen. How many of you know somebody or 20 that needs a touch from heaven and needs an abs absolute, real, tangible, manifest presence touch of God in their life? Yeah. Amen. I think we all do. And so <clears throat> there's, a, there's a, a world today, right now, right this minute, um, there are people staying away from church this morning by the millions. Yes. Yes. They're flocking away from church by the millions. And so um, we've got to talk about that. Why is that? Why would people not want to take an hour and a half, two hours out of their Sunday morning, out of their week to start their week when they could be doing all sorts of other things? Why would people not want to just sow two hours of their time in to be at church this morning? Why wouldn't they want to do that? Well, there are a lot of valid reasons, and I'm not throwing stones. Listen, as I go through this, none of this is stone throwing at anybody except the play church people. This, I, don't, I don't blame folks that don't want to come because they've been hurt by church. I don't blame them because if you don't know the real, you can't really necessarily become upset with the counterfeit. Does that make sense? I was in banking before, and I've told a story. I'll just tell the real short version of it. Um, I was a, a, a bank manager and, and had a great role with the bank, but I started out on the teller line. 
And I'll never forget the very first assignment that I had. They, they moved us around in the management t- training program. Um, you know, we knew we were going to get promoted one day to vice president, which we did. And, but some of us, you know, going through this program, we had these visions of grandeur in our head, right? Straight out of college, 22-year-old kids. And we're like, man, this is great. Well, start on the teller line. And then you just progress. And not only are you going to be a teller, but now we're going to send you to Cheviot, out on the west side of Cincinnati, you can be a teller out there for four weeks. And then you can go to the east side, down to Eastgate or somewhere, and be a teller down there for four weeks. So they really humbled you, right? You had these, these visions of, of making the bank profitable and doing all these loans and, and all these kind of things, but started out counting $50 bills. And, uh, and so when I was down on the west side of Cincinnati, I was in, uh, in, the, in a bank in Cheviot, and uh, <clears throat> a guy, a customer, came in and came to my teller window and, uh, and he was, a, he was a, a real estate guy, had a lot of real, rental properties, and there, a lot, there was a lot of cash being paid in. So he would come in at the first of the month with forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in cash to um, you know, all the people that paid their rent. So you go through these, these stack of hundreds and a stack of 50s and whatever. So I'm going through these 50s, and all of a sudden, oh, something's wrong with this one. And it wasn't even good. I mean, there was no, it was counterfeit. It wasn't even good counterfeit. It was on horrible paper and just all the stuff. I mean, if you're going to launder money, put it in the wash, launder it or something, wrinkle it up, make it, I mean, you know, it just, it was bad. Yeah, walk on. I'm not trying to give any tips on how to launder money. <laughs> what not to do on laundering money. But there was about four or five in a row, and, and, and he, I believe the guy, he said they must have paid, they paid me with that I didn't know was in there because they got $50,000 in cash in. I'm sure some, some passed through his hand. But here's the deal. I understood immediately what was counterfeit. Why? Because I was very, very familiar with what the real felt like. And when you know the real, the play stuff, the counterfeit stuff doesn't seem as appealing and it's absolutely not as valuable. Right? Okay. So now here we're talking about church and we're talking about um, what is real church? I, I can't blame somebody that has never experienced pure, real church. You can't be upset with them for not wanting to have anything to do with play church. You guys shouldn't want to have anything to do with play church either. That's a hint, but we'll get there, okay? All right. So you cannot blame somebody for wanting to stay home. If, if church was all about what I've seen it in different places, I'd rather be at the lake too today on a boat. Not today, it's cold, but anyway, I'd rather be on the golf course. <laughs> I mean, I'd, be, I'd rather be somewhere else where I could just enjoy nature and at least keep my thoughts between me and the Lord or something. I mean, if this is what church is, I don't want to have anything to do with it, right, the, for the play church crowd. So um, Ephesians chapter 1 addresses this, and it's, it's, um, it could be glossed right over, just a couple verses at the end of the chapter, um, but we need to understand this because people that have gone to church for years, I would ask, what is it? Why do they go? What does it accomplish? Why take my valuable time? Because your time is valuable. Your time is the most valuable thing you have. Your time is infinitely more valuable than money. Infinitely. You can spend money and make more back. Double it, triple it, make it 10 times. You spend your time, you don't ever get it back. Yeah. Right? So, so time is way more valuable than money. So I don't want to come in here and waste two hours of my precious, precious life if it's just going to be playing around. But Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 22 and 23. Now this is the end of Paul, uh, Paul's prayer that talks about, um, I pray that the, understand, the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you would know what the hope of his calling is, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance and in the saints is. Like he's, he's going through some real awesome deep stuff. My in, in my top two or three favorite chapters in the whole Bible, I love this. This is how he ends the chapter, excuse me. Verse 22, and hath put all things, God is, is, is the one doing this. God has put all things under his, his is Jesus, under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things, say all things, all to things. the church. Watch this, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So I'm going to go through, obviously, through this series, we're going to go through several verses that contain the word church, okay? This is where I wanted to start because a lot of people know this and some people don't. So we must start with the the basics, okay? Um, 
a lot of people may not know that the church is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church. So from now on, when you hear somebody say body of Christ, you need to think church. When you hear somebody say church, you need to think body of Christ. They're, they're one and the same. It's, it's defined here. Let me, let me read it again. So he's been seated. As a matter of fact, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go back really quick to verse 19. He showed what's the exceeding greatness of his power to usward or toward us who believe. So all of us believers, he's shown his power toward us, right? Watch this. According to the working of his mighty power, how did he work his mighty power? God, how many of you know that God has miraculous mighty power? I mean, all powerful, all mighty, right? There's, there's no second place, I mean, with God. It's God and then there's nobody else holds a candle, right? So how did he show off or how did he work his mighty power? Well, verse 20, which he wrought or worked in Christ. When? How did he demonstrate it? When he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. That word places means realms, spheres of influence, right? Where is that? Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world, but that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet. So he worked this mighty power in Christ. He wrought the most awesome, mightiest working of that might that was on full display. I mean, the might and the power that literally defines who God is. He worked all of that power in the raising of Christ Jesus. Not only the raising of him, but when he raised him, and sat him at his own right hand. Now, chapter two, we won't go there, but chapter two, verses five, six, seven, it says, he raised us up together with him and made us sit together with him in heavenly places. So when God did that for Jesus, his, the working of his mighty power that he demonstrated in raising the Lord Jesus from the depths of, the very depths of curse, brought him up out of that Sheol region and abs the region of the damned. And Jesus led captivity captive and he presented the blood, his blood as a living, uh, you know, as, as, a, as on the mercy seat. It was the atoning sacrifice for all, the entire world. And God blasted down through the very portals of all three realms, heaven, earth, and under the earth. And says, this is my son. This day have I begotten thee. <laughs> Boom. I'm talking about just, I mean, the earth shook so much. When, God, when that happened, even the earth realm shook and people came out of graves. Talk about working his mighty power. And a co-part of what that is, is raising you up together with him and making you sit together with him in heavenly places. I don't know about that. Put chapter 2, verse 6 on the screen so they can see it really quickly. Chapter 2, verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So when he sat down, you sat down. How's that possible? I didn't receive Jesus as my Savior for 2,000 years. Well, that's when you got to step into the reality of who you were created to be. You can reject it and spend an eternity without him if you want to. Or you can receive the best gift that's ever been given and step right into it. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So now this power was wrought. That's how he wrought or worked this power in Christ. And so then he turned around, verse 22 of chapter 1. He turned around and gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things. And head over all things what? To the church. The Amplified says this, chapter, verse 22. And he has put all things under his feet and has appointed him the universal and supreme head of the church, a headship exercised throughout the church. A headship exercised throughout the church. If you wake up one day and your head says, man, I want to do some gardening. How is that idea, that thing that you, that the head has destined to be done today, how is it exercised? It's exercised throughout the body. The head says, this is what we're going to do. And the body says, okay, let's do it. 
You need to understand what I'm saying. This is, this is bigger than just, oh, he's the head and we're the body. Glory be to God. That's a great metaphor. We can all just sleep better now tonight. No. This is the absolute center of all the power that's supposed to be demonstrated is understanding not just the head knowledge of this, but the revelation knowledge of what happens when the head declares and decrees a thing and the body says, yes, sir, I'm in line with that. I'm in a, I'm approve of that. And I'm going to step into that and I'm going to do what the head says to do. Now, all of a sudden, it doesn't matter what part of the body you are. You could be part of the knee joint, get in the body of Christ somewhere. You can be part of the, uh, uh, of the wrist joint, helping to, you know, Get the sword of the spirit, the word of God out there. You could be part of the shoulders and the government, you know, of the church rest on his shoulders. So you might be part of the governmental authority of the church on the earth, in the earth, setting and setting rule and putting things in place. Glory be to God. Thy kingdom come and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And you're just fired up with that. And you're like, I'm going to exercise and I'm, I'm part of the body of Christ that's, that's got a call on me to do that. Well, I just feel like I'm just the little toe in the body of Christ. Well, we need you around for stability. Don't go anywhere. Things become a lot less stable without them pinky toes. I knew a guy one time that lost a pinky toe. He'd tell you that. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter what, it, what place you are in the body. The whole point of all of this is that it all works together for the purpose of walking out and seeing what the head, the Lord Jesus, has decreed and decided that this church is supposed to accomplish in this realm. Yes. So from now on, when you hear body of Christ, you're going to think what? Church. church. When you hear church, you're going to think what? Amen. Body of Christ. Now, verse 23, I'm going to read that. It's a real, real short one-liner. I'm going to read it in the Amplified, though. It says, which is his body... The fullness of him who fills all in all, for in that body, oh, get this, glory be to God, in that body lives the full measure of him who makes everything complete and who fills everything everywhere with himself. <laughs> the body is how he fills everything everywhere with himself by the body of Christ all over the four corners of the globe, everywhere thrusting who Jesus is literally into this realm. Yes. It's what we're called to do. Amen. Not supposed to sit back and listen to a politician tell you what to do. Amen. You're supposed to dictate in this region and in this state, in this nation, in this world, if believers all over the world exercised their kingdom authority so that thy kingdom could come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and not been quiet about it, we'd be able to accomplish and get kingdom truth in the land where abortion is concerned. Some of you guys know that I, that's top on my list of things that I vehemently hate is abortion. And I do not use words softly, I, I, with, lightly or with, without thinking about them. I hate to the nth degree beyond anything I could possibly put in English words, I hate abortion. And the body of Christ sitting around, not exercising kingdom authority, has allowed this, take politicians out of it for just a minute. Forget about what's being voted in, in the, at the local level or at the state house in Ohio or at the, the Capitol, you know, in, in Washington. Forget about that for just a minute because that's, that is how it's exercised out. And we need to be involved in that. I'm all for that. And we'll even talk about that over the next couple of weeks. But for now, let's just talk about on a kingdom level. How's the kingdom of God spread? Do, is, it, is it somebody getting on TV and saying, everybody needs to be saved right now. Everybody gets saved. No, or is it somebody that somebody else trusts coming to them and saying, I got something, I got to talk, talk to you about this. It's completely, radically revolutionized and changed my life. I got to tell you about this Jesus. Because you used to drink with me and you used to smoke dope with me. And you and I used to go out and get girls and you and I used to do this and you and I used to do that and you and I used to do all these things, but I'm not the same person. You would not believe what, this, what Jesus has done for me. But once you see it, you'll believe it. Once you experience it, you'll believe it and you'll tell everybody else too. And then all of a sudden, one person is won over by the goodness of God. Amen. Now, what if that happened again 
and again, and again, and again. And one became two, four, eight, 16, 32, uh, 64, 128, 256, whatever. 512, 1024, 200, 2048, 4096. What if that became, what if that just happened? What if that happened and all of a sudden, over the next two years, there was a sweeping because the church did its job and quit playing church and became the real church and took the message to their neighbors and to their families and to their cousins and said, listen, it's not about the latest CD and about the latest Christian jam that's going on. That's great, man. This is, Christian music's great. I love Christian music. But it's not just about that. It's about being real so that your life is changed so that you don't think the way you used to think. You don't talk the way you used to talk. You don't think about worldly things anymore in the same way, all of a sudden you're kingdom minded and your whole life is radically changed because of it. Yeah. Now, if that happened and one person who hated abortion and had the love of God shed abroad in their heart, all of a sudden became two people that listened to what the word said about it and were not influenced by what somebody else says about it or what somebody else says that the word says about it. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. What if one person that hated abortion became two, and then four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, hundred and twenty, uh, all the way through? What if what if that happened? Now all of a sudden we have a nation that hates abortion. Now all of a sudden that nation shows up on the state house steps, and doesn't just they don't have to say much. <laughs> they don't have to say much when they take up nineteen city blocks. And all of a sudden, the people are just shaking their head. The polling numbers, what is going on here? Uh, this can't be right. 92% of people say that they're, not, they're against abortion. 92%? Can you, got, can you go repoll these people? It comes back a week later. 92.5% of people say that they're against abortion. Politicians are greedy. Politicians are selfish. Politicians, by and large, if a politician looks, I'm not making a blanket, by and large, are some of the most narcissistic, all about them people that you'll ever meet in your life, for the most part. When they see 92% of people don't like a thing, guess what their position is going to become, real quick. If they want a paycheck, guess what their position is. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter if it's Democrat, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, every party will be against abortion really quickly if 92% of the people are against abortion. I'm telling you, trust me. So here's the thing, though. My point is the kingdom does that. Buying airtime and screaming the loudest doesn't do it. Because people, if they see that, I'm, I'm not against buying airtime. I'm all for, you know, people with the values that I value, buying airtime and, and having commercials about, you know, getting people back in church and bringing this nation back to God and all, the, all those things. But if people just see the commercials and then they see, turn around and those same people are hypocrites, cheating on their spouse, and cheating on their taxes, and trying to get one over on somebody else and all these things, that's playing church. They don't want to have anything to do with that. Right. Come on now. Amen or oh me. Amen. Stick with me this morning. So how important is the church? You're in Ephesians. Go to the right about three pages to Ephesians 5, verse 25. Ephesians 5, 25 says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people think, and we talk about this in marriage counseling. When my wife and I do marriage counseling uh, or premarital counseling, we talk about this, obviously, a lot. You guys have heard me preach on this first. But this passage of Scripture is not using the body of Christ as a way to explain marriage. Amen. Amen. It's, he's using marriage... Something that people can see as a way of explaining unseen kingdom truth. He's not using Jesus in the body of Christ as, a, as an example for husbands and wives. No, he's saying, and I know that when you read through it, it can look like that. But the point is, most people know what a marriage is supposed to look like. But they don't understand really exactly what Jesus did for them. It starts out at the very top of this chapter, verse 1. 
It says, um, it be imitators, be you followers of God as dear children. The Amplified says imitators. Be you followers, therefore, of God as dear children. Verse two, watch this. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved hath loved us and hath given himself for us, who's us, the church, the body of Christ, given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice for a, uh, to God for a sweet smelling savor. So our job is to be imitators of God. Our job is to, is to operate like God operates in the earth. We're supposed to be imitators and live how he lives. We're supposed to live that out in the, in the earth, in the world. Amen. And so it says in verse 25, Love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now there's the phrase I want you to see. We're talking about church. His body, chapter one, his body, which is the church, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, so we find out that the body of Christ is the church. Now we find out in chapter five, verse 25, we're supposed to uh, love our wives. Why? As Christ has loved the church and gave himself for it. Gave himself for it. Gave himself for it. So Jesus literally loved the church so much that she, the church, she is the reason that Jesus gave himself. She's the reason he gave himself up. She's the reason he laid his life down. Let the weight of that settle on you. You know that God, you know, God sent Jesus for he so loved the world that he sent Jesus to die for you. But now Jesus aligned himself with the Father and love the church so much that he said, not my will, but yours be done. Yeah. Acts chapter 20. How, how did he do this? Well, I'm glad you asked. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Take heed, <clears throat> therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock... All the flock, all the flock. Now, the flock is a local segment of the church, the universal body of Christ. The flock, this is, part, this is a flock right here as a, meta, metaphorically speaking, of the bigger body of Christ. Yes. Okay? So, talking to me, this instruction is to me as a minister. Watch this. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock. Over, which, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Now I'm perking up here, maybe more than some of the rest of you should or, or need to because I'm an overseer here. Yes. To feed the church, 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 church. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Amen. So first of all, we find out that the church is the body of Christ. Second of all, we find out that Jesus loved the church so much that that's the reason he gave himself up for it. Now, thirdly, we find out that Jesus literally purchased the church with his own blood. Jesus literally purchased the body of Christ, the church with his own blood. The highest price ever paid for anything in the history of the known universe. He paid it. He was the church. You listen, you guys understand that what we're talking about, real church. Now, of course, you, you're part of that. But I think that I find it very interesting that the Bible talks about the church as a whole. Jesus looked at us universally as a whole. Now, listen, you're, you're very important. You, he knows the hair on your head, uh, I, I, the number of hairs on your head. He, I mean, you are individually of utmost value, value to God. But the system, he said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. Not those who were lost. I came to seek and to save, Jesus said, that which was lost. What's the that? The kingdom system that was set up and ordained in the garden for Adam to function in and to move throughout life and to multiply himself to completely dominate the entire planet. He gave him word. He gave him seed. Not only every herb bearing seed, but also the seed that's in his body. He, God gave him words and seed to dominate the entire planet. That was lost. So Jesus came to seek and to save the system that was lost in the garden because of some 
um, selfish decision of people who still make those decisions today. Don't put this all on Eve. First of all, put it on Adam because the woman was deceived, but the man was not. And she wasn't even there when God said, don't eat of that tree. The very next verse he said, he noticed that he needed a helpmate. So God, Eve wasn't even on the scene. So don't put that on Eve. Now here's the thing. Don't put it on Adam and Eve solely. Put it on yourself. When you woke up one day last week and you wanted to be your God. It's the same humanistic thought process. That's why we need to renew our mind out from that. But don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen? Praise God. Are you enjoying this so far? All right. Now, go with me to Matthew chapter 16. Because some of you may know this, but some of you may not know the very first place that the word church ever shows up in the Bible. We're going to read it. And because of the law of first mention, we've got to understand that when something is mentioned for the first time in the Bible, it, it carries a little extra weight because that definition, what, how it's defined in its first mention, in the first talking about, is really carries weight as to what the thing is. Jesus defines what the church is here. And I, and I wasn't trying to be flippant earlier on when I said there are people in this room that don't have any idea what church is. And that's, that's not to make you feel bad. That's just made to make you listen up. Amen. Because when I, I was a pastor, talk about real talk. Let me just be real with you. I knew the ins and outs of this, and I knew whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and these kind of things, but I never put the pieces together of what real church was until after I was a pastor for about five or six years. Did I get this? Don't look at me like that. (laughs) All right. Matthew 16, verse 13. Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his, his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Eli, Elijah, uh, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, Okay, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, answered, I'm going to stop at the end of verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So, I've preached this so many times, but just to camp here for 20 seconds. Peter did not hear this from seminary. He didn't have time to Google the answer. He didn't have time to ask anybody else. He said this answer out of his inner man. He answered, and Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You've never heard anybody talking about this, Jesus said, including me. Right? He was flesh and blood too. He said, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So Jesus is acknowledging right here in front of everybody that Simon Peter, Simon Barjona, he's getting ready to change his name to Peter here in the next couple of verses. But Simon is, has just heard from God. Listen up, everybody. Your boy Simon over here just heard from God. You know how I've been hearing from God? You know how I've been hearing from heaven and it just wowed you and and you guys have been in awe? Guess what? Somebody else can too. And so watch this. So he says, my father which is in heaven, verse 18. Here we go. First time the word church ever shows up in the Bible. And I say also unto thee that thou art Petra, Peter. And upon this rock, this rock, not Peter, not his name. Peter means rock, but he's not talking about that. Upon this rock, the revelation that you just had come out of your heart, that flesh and blood didn't tell you, that my father told you, and you had never heard before, upon that rock, this revelation, watch this. I will build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. So first of all, Pastor Anthony, guess what? This is not your church. I understand that. Thank you. I just wanted you to know. Just having a conversation with myself. I remind myself of that all the time. This is not my church. I want to come visit your church sometime, Pastor. I've, you know, if I know him well enough, I'll say, you know, I don't want to be a, just a smart aleck jerk. 
you know, I'll say, sometimes I'll say, okay, come on over, we'd love to have you. But some people, if I know them well enough, I want to come visit your church, I'll say, it's not my church. Because I've renewed my mind so much to the fact that this is not my church. Upon this revelation that came out of the inner man of Peter, Jesus said, I will build my church. So it's Jesus' church, and guess who's building it? He is. He is. So we don't need to build it. A common misunderstanding of what just came out of my mouth, that we don't need to build the church, is the number one reason that we have so much play church all over the world. Because people are trying to fulfill a spiritual mandate to see the church grow, but they want to do it with laser light shows and smoke machines. I'm just here to tell you, it is not going to be based, I'm ahead of myself. <clears throat> I'm going to pause that sentence. So the biggest key ever, the number one component of the purpose of the church is to know that Jesus himself literally has built and is building the whole thing on the revelation of the anointing. I want you to see that. Peter didn't say, just you're the son of the living God. He said, who do you say that I am? Peter did not just answer, oh, you're the son of God. No, he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus, you are the Christ, not his last name. You are the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are Yeshua Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one in the flesh. You are a fleshly representation of the anointing of God. I'm going to say that one more time. You are a fleshly representation in human form of the anointing of God. And Jesus immediately looks at him and said, you're blessed, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you upon the revelation that the anointing can reside in the flesh. On the revelation that the anointing of God, kingdom manifestation, can uh, 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 arrive and be in, inside human form. On that revelation, I'm going to build my whole church. Yes. So here's a problem that we have. This is one of the things about play church that we need to address. If that's the case, then any church, I'm, I, don't, I don't make blanket statements very often, but I, when I do, it's with purpose. Any church, everybody say any church. any church. Any church that shies away from the anointing is play church. Because the whole church is built on the anointing. Yeah. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know. What, what if somebody says something in a different language in tongues that I don't understand? Well, okay. It's okay to question it. 100% okay to question it. It's 100% okay to come talk to me. I'm going to teach later on this year or in January about the difference in, um, in the Holy Spirit in us and upon us. The infilling presence, indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and the infilling power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to answer some of these things. And if you've got questions about that, come see me. Because it's really clear in the Bible. But don't just swallow hook, line, and sinker that that's not for today because somebody else that doesn't understand it told you it wasn't for today. I don't understand how you can be in a prayer line, Pastor, and you can look at a lady and tell her that her husband wasn't going to have to go in for surgery on kidney stones, and you didn't even know that he had kidney stones. How can that possibly be, Pastor? I can't figure that out. Well, that's okay. That's the anointing. I could go through a dozen times where I've looked at somebody and known, had a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge and known something that... I don't say this lightly, that word, not Pastor Anthony, that word completely radically transformed their life, life and they're completely different now than they used to be. The anointing did that because the anointing removes burdens and destroys yokes. The anointing did that. So don't tell me that we can't have the anointing in church because Christ literally means the anointed one. So if you don't want the anointing in church, you don't want Christ in this church because Christ is the anointed one. Yeah, yeah. So if you're not for those things, that you are demonstrating the spirit of anti-Christ. I, I know that that sounds extremely harsh, but I'm just using Bible terms. 
I'm just using, people think antichrist means, you know, that, that people just don't believe in God and there's going to be some evil person that rises up with eight horns out of his head or something in the Middle East someday and he's going to be the antichrist. No, the spirit of antichrist is alive and well in churches all around the world. And it's, it's masquerading as people that want to not offend people and people that want to make sure that everybody can understand logically everything that's going on. Well, now, listen, I, I, don't want, I don't come up here and preach in tongues. I wouldn't do that because we do things biblically, decently, and in order, right? Paul says, in the church, in the church. I'd rather speak five words in a known language than 10,000 words in an unknown language. So there's, there's a way for everything to flow perfectly where people can be built up and understand these things. There's a right way to do it. Everybody say there's a right way and there's a wrong way. But playing church is not just some of the things, the top three or four things that probably jump into your mind. Let's, uh, let's move on here. I don't know how far I'll get today, maybe another 15 minutes or so. Um, so I don't know how, much, how, how far I'll get in that time, but that's why it's a series, okay? We'll be back next week. Here's the thing. Jesus is building the whole church, has built and is building the whole church on the revelation of the anointing. Yes. Ecclesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, Ecclesia. This is not a Hebrew term. When he is speaking to these men and he looks at Simon Barjona and he renames him Peter, he says, on this rock, I'm going to build my ecclesia. He didn't, it was, he wasn't sharing this in Aramaic. I mean, the rest of the sentence might have been, but he used a Roman term. This is a Greek yes. word, ecclesia. Yes. This is not a Hebrew term. This is not a concept that you can find in the Old Testament. That's why when people say, uh, you're a New Testament church, well, yeah, because the New Testament is the only place you'll find church. Yeah. 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 There's no church in the Old Testament. Right. Yeah. There are a lot of religious rules, regulations. There are a lot of hoops to jump through to be looked at as righteous, but not be righteous. There was synagogue. There was a priesthood. There were a lot of things, but there was no church in the Old Testament. Yeah. Stick. Is anybody learning anything today? All right. So Ecclesia, here it is. The, the definition, the first definition in Strong's Concordance is this. And if you want to write this down, I'll say it twice kind of slowly so you can write it down. The Ecclesia is a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place, an assembly that was specifically to set government and rule over an area. I'll say it again. A gathering of citizens called out from their homes into a public place, an assembly. This was specifically to set government and rule over an area. So why did Jesus use a Roman term? Why did he use a Greek word? Because he's talking to some men that understood Roman authority. They're living in a Roman colony. I mean, the Romans... The Roman Empire had rule there. So an ecclesia in Roman terms in, in that day was where Roman citizens would come out from their homes and they would gather in a square or in a building or someplace in a public place, not in somebody's home. They would come out from their homes yeah. to a place of gathering. Yeah. You'll, you'll see here in just a few minutes why I'm doing church at home by myself. It's not even possible. Biblically speaking, you can't do that. But we'll get there in a second. So they come out together, what? To set government and rule over an area or a region. So the Roman citizens would come out. They would hear what the kingdom said, the decree from the kingdom, from Caesar. They would understand how it got trickled out. And so they would gather in their region to find out what the king said. I know he's called Caesar. I'm calling him king for right now because we have a king. We don't have a Caesar, we have a king. So they would hear what the king said, the Caesar said, and they would decree that thing, what the crown said, and they would exercise that government and that rule over their area and their region. And they would enforce that government's mandates in their region. 
So I'm going to break this up into three things. We'll at least get through this before we leave. I'm going to break it up in three things. A gathering of citizens who were called out together to set rule, law, and government over an area. A gathering of citizens called out together to set rule over an area. Okay, so number one, a gathering of citizens. The ecclesia in Roman times was not a mixture of citizens and non-citizens. I'm going to let that settle. You don't want unsaved people to come to church? Oh, yeah. I want them to come in here by the dozens and hundreds someday. But ecclesia is a gathering of citizens called out together to set rule. It wasn't, they didn't, the, the Romans to their ecclesia in the Roman Empire, they didn't invite non-Roman citizens. Now, if somebody wanted to go out and convert somebody to become a Roman citizen, now all of a sudden they had a place of authority and a say in what happens in their region to take, are you guys hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. This is the problem. This is a big problem. Because so many churches today are catering to non-citizens. They market to non-citizens. They design every bit of their service for non-citizens. Oh, I'm going to preach it. <laughs> Just wait a minute. <laughs> Everything's, everything revolves around the non-citizens. We can't offend the non-citizens. We got to make sure the non-citizens feel comfortable in here. Well, listen, a Hebrew person didn't feel comfortable in a gathering of Roman citizens. Because they had, it, albeit heavy-handed, they had rule over them. And the Hebrew person, the lowly Hebrew person under Roman rule knew that what they said went, whether they liked it or not. They were either going to have to get in line or whatever, but the kingdom was marching on with or without them. <laughs> Is it stirring around in your spirit right now? Glory to God. I've got four more bullet points just on a gathering of citizens. I am called, this is Pastor Anthony. I am called, literally called by my heavenly father. Me, not you guys, this is me right here. I am called to build up the citizens so they can go out and convert non-citizens into citizens so that those citizens can come in and also get built up. I can't convert your non-citizen neighbor. I don't know your non-citizen neighbor. I can't convert your non-citizen coworker. I don't know him or her. I can't convert your non-citizen cousin that you're going to be with at Thanksgiving. I don't know them. My job is to build you up, to set kingdom and government rule in here to such a degree that you're so sure of who you are in Christ and in this kingdom realm that you want to go out and make sure that everybody else you know gets in on this kingdom living. When the focus is on impressing, listen here, this is big. When the focus becomes on impressing non-citizens, the citizens are left wondering how to survive and thrive in the kingdom in which they're a citizen. When everything is catered around non-citizens, non-believers, non-kingdom citizens, then you've got citizens in there just kind of twiddling their thumbs thinking, I don't have any idea, anything new that I've learned in this play church for the last 20 years because I just keep hearing the same things over and over. I need kingdom value so that I can understand how to be a citizen. And they flounder and they don't know how to be citizens of the kingdom. Watch this. This leaves them undiscipled and then they don't know how to go out and reproduce and be productive. Well, first of all, you cannot reproduce something that you've never produced. If you're not productive, you can't reproduce something. I'm going to go out and reproduce myself, Pastor Anthony. Well, what are you going to reproduce? You haven't been to a Wednesday night church service in five years. I've never seen you at a Sunday night prayer service. I've never, you, you know, I, just step back here. 
Because listen, this, it, it, see, the moment that I start saying those kind of things, your focus shifts on, oh, I need to come to those things because pastor will think, no, no. If you wanted to be the most you could possibly be as a citizen, you'd want to be with all your other citizens so that you could rub shoulders and rub elbows and your best friends in the world would be your fellow citizens. Not just sliding by and coming every once in a while when you can. Okay, a gathering of citizens called out together. Number two, called out together. By very definition, by very definition, you cannot have church by yourself at home. Now, I understand if you're physically unable to drive. I understand that there are people that are shut in that we are getting the word to them. We have people that call them. We take meals to people. They're, listen, I understand that. Maybe there's a, a surgery that you're recovering, recovering from and you've got four or five weeks that you're gonna be laid up and you're watching at home. That's, that's wonderful. I'm so thankful that we have a live stream. I'm thankful for technology. I'm thankful that we can get ourselves into that realm so that we can uplift them and encourage them or whatever. But I just got news. You can turn this off and be mad at me and never turn it on again. But I gotta tell you this. If you've been doing church by yourself for three years and never participated, you're not doing church. Yes. Right. Amen. By definition, Amen. the ecclesia is a gathering, a group of citizens called out to meet together. I, don't get mad at me. I didn't write the Greek definition of the word. I didn't. It's true that you're church. I, you're, you are the church. Anybody wearing that, that T-shirt that we had? I am the church. Yes, that's true. The, the more, I'm not, the, those T-shirts are awesome. I wear, in the summer, I probably wear one at least once a week. I am the church. Specifically, you're part of the church. Like, Jesus died for you. That's true. If you were the only one in the world, Jesus would have died for you. Yes. But here's the thing. You weren't. Yes. And you're not. Amen. These things are good. It's, it's great to say, if I was the only one in, in, the, in the whole of the planet Earth, Jesus would have died for me. Well, that's great. And it's true. But it's a hypothetical that's never going to be played out. Because you're not the only one. And so we have a kingdom, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And, and for us to get the kingdom of God, heaven's principles thrust into and overtaking, the violent take it by force. To take over what Satan has stolen, Jesus provided the antidote, the answer, and called us to go get it. So a gathering of citizens called out together, I'm up against a little time crunch, to set rule, law, and government in a region. Last thing. To so set rule, law, and government over an area. Actually, this is why he kept preaching in verse 19. He told Matthew, he said, Matthew, keep writing. I got verse 19 here for you. He didn't say that. It's a joke. All right. So he said, I will build my church on this rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, next verse, 19. And. Everybody say and. And. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Watch this. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I'm going to read that phrase for time's sake really quickly out of the Amplified. It says this. Um, whatever you bind, declare to be improper and unlawful. On earth must be what is already. Everybody say already already bound in heaven and whatever you loose or declare to be lawful on earth must be what is already loosed in heaven. See, people use this verse of scripture and say, listen, I'm binding this on earth. Now, God, you back my play and you bind it too now. Come on, because the world's going to think I'm a hypocrite if you don't show up and do something. I need God to show up in my life. No, that, that, those are either not, we'll just say this, not really proficient citizens <laughs> talking that way. Because if you understand what the word of God's talking about, you understand that you don't declare a thing and decree a thing and then God backs your play. That's not how it works. You find out, you got to get in the word and you've got to get in your heart one-on-one -on -one with Holy Spirit and be talking and communing and loving on Holy Spirit and allowing him to love on you so much so that you just become literally so one that your thoughts are one and your desires are one and everything is so one that you know what heaven has already declared to be unlawful. So you can say, heaven, 
Heaven has bound and declared it to be unlawful that this sickness should be in my child's body, that this sickness should be in my home, that this, that this whatever should be operating in my household. So I, it's already bound in heaven. I bind it on earth in the name of Jesus. And you watch it happen when you come at it from that place of revelation. And then also the op opposite, loose. You're loose or declared to be lawful. Provision. Joy in the, in, in, right in the middle of the saddest day of your life, it's been declared lawful by the courts of heaven that you have joy unspeakable and full of glory. So you declare that to be lawful and you loose that in your life. Yes. You've got the key to do it. Do you hear what I'm saying? You've got the key to do it. He said, because you understand this revelation, because you understand that I'm the Christ, the son of the living God, now you can operate in some thing. I'm going to give you some keys so you can use that revelation to bring it into your realm. Right. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. 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 I'll finish up just talking about this and then we'll unhook for today. You can't think carnally about this. What I just said, you're to find out from the head of the church what's lawful and declare that to be lawful in your world. You're to find out what's to be unlawful so you don't fall for the wily tricks of the enemy. So you don't fall for everything that he puts in your path and tries to get you to call it normal when God's called it a curse and says it doesn't have any place in your life. Amen. That is the very definition of what the gates of hell cannot prevail against. What is that, Pastor? A man or a woman of God who is so understanding of these key kingdom principles that they will not fall for something that the gates of hell are trying to bring and bombard and trying to bring into your life to overwhelm you or take hold of you or grab you somehow and, and keep you uh, condemned or keep you confined or keep you held back, keep you fruitless in your life. Now you've got keys to the kingdom. You've got, oh, you've got authority beyond what any of us, including myself, can possibly fathom. Yes. Authority, authority, authority. Hallelujah. I've run out of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unplug right now because some of you are so full, like walking out of the, walking out of the uh, buffet, right? Just walking out like this. Oh. I feel like if I put one more bite of food into you, you're just going <laughs> to... <laughs> Amen. Now don't get, listen, I know this whole series, hopefully you want to come back for the next two or three weeks of this series because we, we just defined church. That's all we've done today is just defined it and talked about how Jesus died for it, purchased us with his own blood, how you are the church, the body of Christ, how wherever the head goes, the body goes, glory be to God. Do not decapitate Jesus. You hear me? I hear the sound <laughs> of an abundance of rain. Amen. Here's the thing. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. I have, to, I, I have to unplug. I have to unhook. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll say it next week. Oh, you don't want to get wet. It is coming down pretty hard. Yes. You want three or four more minutes? Yes. Let this pass. The Lord's trying to say. Here's a problem. Okay, let, rubber meeting the road. Here's where the rubber meets the road. And this is where it sounds so right. And if you hear yourself in this, listen, it's like the guy that was petting his cat. The cat was uh, on his lap and there in the easy chair, and he's petting his cat. And somebody said, you're petting that cat the wrong way. You don't pet it tail to head. You got to pet it the other way. He said, if that cat doesn't like it, he can turn around. <laughs> if this is going cross grain of your thinking, you're the one that needs to turn your thinking around. <laughs> All right, two more minutes, I promise, just two more minutes. So here's the thing. So do, ha, do these sound familiar? Um, I, need to go, I need to get to a church where I can really connect with the worship. Sound pretty good, right? I need teaching that will inspire me. 
I need a children's ministry to engage my kids. I need youth group. I need small groups that are really going to what? What's the thing in common for all that? I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. It's the American consumerism mentality. They think that they're out. They picked out a sweater and they picked out a car and they picked out a house and they picked out all these things, a school district, everything. Let me pick out a church that's going to meet my needs. Now, when I started saying all those things, I ain't gonna point anybody out, but a lot of people were shaking their head. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. I need a church with the worship I can connect with. Now, listen, does it look like that we are so con- disconnected from the world that we just put slides up, you know, on the, the overhead projectors? You know what I'm talking about, the, from the 1984, the, the, the transparencies, right, on the side of the screen. We've grown with the times. We don't despise technology. But how about you don't look for all those things to pick your church out. How about you just come out and be the church and you bring your supply and you be ready to come early to prayer before church to jump in and be part of what the church is. Would you come if it were just 25 people and a bad sound system and no air conditioning? I'm serious. I'm serious. This is a serious question. And you don't, have to, you don't have to answer it out loud for me to, to please me. This is for your heart. This is between you and Jesus. I'm not asking for an out loud answer. Would you come if we didn't have good music and we didn't have an easy way for you to bring your, to, to, to read this, the uh, verses so you don't have to bring your own Bible and you don't have to take notes and you don't have to, listen. This is real talk. I'm not playing church anymore. Be resolute that you're not playing church anymore. Bring a Bible. If you don't want to write in your Bible, then put it up on a shelf somewhere and go buy you one you can write in. Bring a notebook. Get engaged. Find somebody new that was amen and the same things you were during church and go across the way and find them after church and introduce yourself and buy them lunch. Get to know them. Start rubbing shoulders with them. Because if we don't stop this... If we don't stop this, we'll just be playing church. It's not just about having anointed uh, ministry times where there are people who might be on the floor and there are people who, because we've had people go on the floor and get up with new rotator cuffs and new body parts. I'm talking about going into surgery that week with pink, fresh, baby-like body parts. That's happened on multiple occasions in this church. So don't tell me, I don't, want, I don't feel comfortable in that atmosphere. Well, if you needed a new shoulder, you'd feel comfortable in that atmosphere. Amen. Well, I'm visiting and my church doesn't do that. Well, you, you don't want me to tell you what I think about what church you should be in then. Because it won't be very popular. Oh, but I got so many friends there. And we all go out to eat after church and there's all these, all my friends are there. <laughs> well, if you're the one that needs a new shoulder, is that a friend that you're going to be able to call and get a new one? Nope. <laughs> you need new friends. <laughs> Listen, I love you guys. This is not, I'm not saying any of this to prove a point. I'm saying this because I'm like David. I'm saying this as unto the Lord. I'm just thanking the Lord. This is all my praise and thanksgiving is because of what the Lord Jesus has done. Yes. Quit playing church. I don't, I don't really believe that we do, but I've been guilty in some areas just as much as anybody else. I have not gotten this right 100% of the time. That's just pastor being really real with you. There are times I shouldn't have preached, and I did. There are times I preached too long, and I should have stopped halfway through and prayed for 30 people and seen them receive the miraculous. There are times that I, have, I haven't gotten it right every week. There are some weeks that I can go back to my office and take my jacket off and sit in my chair and I literally can feel it with every cell in my being well done. There are some times I just go back there and I'm like, missed it. Because I just, for a moment in time, I didn't want to call somebody out and let their life be changed because of what somebody else might say or we were live streaming it or whatever. So that person might go on and battle depression for the next three months because I was playing church. You have the luxury of walking out the door and getting in your car and never knowing what that feels like. 
But I promise you, we are not going to play church. There's a world that has no idea who God is. There's a world that has no tangible clue of what it is like to have your life so radically transformed that they can smile and be joyful. See, this all goes hand in hand. What I was talking about after coming out of worship is part of it. This right here is playing church, you guys. During worship, this is playing church. I didn't come to entertain you. I'm not that good of a piano player. And I'm certainly not that good of a singer. My wife is. But don't, don't aim in too loud on that one. <laughs> I've never impressed anybody singing. It's not the reason I do it. But we'll come next week, if Jesus says so, we'll come next week and I'll have mom play that piano and all of our worship team and everybody will stand right here and face this way and we'll just have a piano and we'll sing hymns for 45 minutes. I don't care. I'm telling you that I don't care. There aren't enough words in the English language to fully express to you how much I don't care what the world thinks. Because we've got a mandate and we're part of the 11th hour harvest. Whether you realize it or not, we're part of the 11th hour harvest. And we're supposed to be bringing in nets beyond what the human mind can comprehend. And I'm going to do my part. Amen. If, people, if there's anybody upset and doesn't come back next week, if half of you come back next week, that's fine. We will have real church next week. Father, Father, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for being intentional about what you said. And when you looked at Simon in the eyes and said, you're blessed, because you've got heavenly revelation that I couldn't have told you. Father, if Jesus couldn't get it across in words, I know my words today alone didn't do it. But Holy Spirit, take the words that I shared and wrap them in revelation. And Father, I know, before I ever preached my first sermon, I know that my words changed nothing. But my words wrapped with the revelation power of God the anointing dripping off of these words will change everything. It'll remove every burden and destroy every yoke. It'll absolutely change the course of each and every person's life that'll just dive into it and receive it. And I thank you for it. May we go out of here not being just hearers, but may we reflect on these things this week, Father, and come back ready to jump into worship, ready to jump into the word, ready to receive ready to receive, ready to receive, ready to receive everything that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and share this video with a friend today. And remember, most importantly, that Jesus is Lord and you are complete in him.